hopefully what you'll leave here with is better questions. I mean, my goal as a result of 90 minutes is that most people walk out of here going, wow, I never thought of it that way. This interaction of white men and diversity. Both if I'm a white man, I've never thought of it this way, as well as if I'm not. What's the interaction that go between those? So hopefully that's the goal as we, we go out of here. So learning reminders, because this is about learning together. This is not about me up here with all the answers telling you um, the gospel truth, okay? We're all learning and exploring together. We all have different experiences. We all have different things to contribute here. And nobody has to give up their beliefs, their personal history, their life experiences, their values here. Right? We each get to own those. Hopefully we get to share some of those. A big thing I do want to challenge you to do is notice, both for yourself and those around you, because we're going to be working in small groups and as a large group, when you fall into either or thinking or both and thinking. Most of us have been trained to be really good either or thinkers. Number one, because it's simpler, right? Is it this or is it that? I want, I want an answer, right? The reality with a lot of work around diversity is it's both and, and it's difficult for a lot of us to get in that space. So I'll just use an example. One of the things that we're going to talk about is um, privilege. As a white guy, you are privileged. Have any white guys heard that in the room? Have any of you felt that you've been really privileged in your life? Well, a couple of us have. Most of our experience is, I work damn hard for what I've gotten in my life. No one handed me anything on a silver platter, right? And so you can see the setup for this either or argument. Oh, I'm not privileged, damn it. Yes, you are. It's not going to get us very far. The reality is, can it be possible that I worked really hard for everything I've gotten in life, and there were some things going on around me that helped me a lot that I didn't notice, right? Do you see a different conversation that comes out of both of those? Right? That's what this is about, because the reality is no one's got the, the, the only truth. It's everybody's got their perspective on the truth. So we really want to notice when we're getting in an either or a both and perspective. And as a result of that, which is kind of linked to that, I'm going to encourage you and invite you to lean into those areas that just feel uncomfortable or wrong. You know, when somebody says something, to be able to say, wow, that doesn't even make sense to me, or I'm noticing I'm getting really frustrated, or I'm getting angry hearing that, or I'm in disbelief. Just to be able, because that's where the conversations are going to come from and the learning is going to come from. Remain inquisitive, explore your assumptions. The last one, and this is difficult, again, because we all learn in different ways, and this is culturally set up for 90 minutes move through real fast, so I'm, I'm apologizing in advance, but in order to get enough content for people to get value out of this, I'm going to shut down conversations, and this is the way it's going to feel. You're going to be in a small group having these great conversations, someone's going to say something, you're going to have this brilliant insight, you're going to be like, I want to share this, and then I'm going to say, okay, everybody stop talking, right? And so the reality is I need you to somehow contain yourself from the most brilliant thing you've ever thought to say, <laughs> right? Because right? it's going to be happening at each table, but if we do that every time, we won't get through in 90 minutes. So I want to encourage you to continue the conversations outside of here, but in order to go through a number of conversations to get some of the content, I am going to interrupt you, so bear with me, and we'll see how well that works as we go through this together. All right? So initials up there, and then I'm just giving the company, uh, one of the companies that I work for a plug. White Men is Full Diversity Partners down at the bottom, WMFDP.com. Great resource for a lot of information around this, so just want to give them a plug and also give you a basis for um, where this work comes from and our philosophy or our operating assumptions as we do this work as a, as a place to start. And it's what we talked about a little at the beginning. To have successful diversity and inclusion efforts, everybody has got to be involved, right? Which includes white guys especially when a larger percent of your organization is white guys. You're not going to have successful diversity and inclusion efforts if the white men in your organization are not fully engaged and see value in it and see benefit in it, right? So that's just a given. We talked a little bit about this, right? White men are often unaware of their own culture, we spend a lot of time with that, and the systemic advantage they might receive as a result of it. They have a lack, we, I, have a lack of awareness about that. Doesn't make me bad, doesn't make me stupid, <laughs> We're going to talk again about why the dynamics are set up so that I don't see it, okay? Also, receiving systemic advantage as a white man doesn't mean that I haven't been discriminated against individually, and we're going to talk about that dynamic, so that's back to the both and, and we can get into a lot of conflict around that, all right? This is my belief. The majority of people want to be effective diversity partners, 
right? A lot, and a lot of the assumptions people have about white men is we don't want to be, because we've got something to lose and all this other stuff. So I just want you to n check your assumption around that. We're going to talk about it. Um, most of us just don't know how to do it. And the reality is everybody in this room has got work to do around this topic, right? White guys, we've got our work, which is really around uncovering our blind spots about the dynamics that go on. And we'll get into this in more detail. People of color, women, people that aren't heterosexual, kind of the dominant cultural white men, you've got to check your assumptions about our motivations. And I'm just going to leave it there for now, because we'll get into the detail about what that's about. But that's typically, when I work with large groups or with individuals, that's the difference. We all have work to do. It's just different work that we've got to do. This is tough, right? This is, if this was easy, we would not be spending all this time and all this money and all doing this, right? This is hard stuff because it's about uncovering things that are hard to see. It's about challenging beliefs that we've had for our whole life and our parents had before us and the media feeds us. It's tough to do and it's ongoing. Like I said, you're not going to walk out of here with the answers. You're going to walk out of here with some better questions and a couple answers. And this last one is, you can't do this without having emotion, conflict, turbulence. You can't do this work. And when we, when we talk about kind of cultural norms, the white male cultural norm, at least as I understand it and as I've researched, researched it and experienced is, and so any of you in the room who had similar experiences as a child, if you started getting really upset and yelling at the dinner table, what did your parents say to you? You're excused. And what usually followed for me was go to your room and when you settle down, and you've calmed down, then come back and we'll have a conversation about it. So that's a norm that's part of most businesses in the United States that I've been a part of, which is the norm is we want calm, rational, quiet discussions. It does not happen with this topic. You're not going to get very far, and we'll talk about why. But I want you to just notice that one of the dynamics that keeps us from getting anywhere on this is there's this rule, spoken or unspoken, that we need to have calm, quiet, intellectual conversations about a very emotional, <laughs> right, complex topic. So just, I just want to put that up there that that's a given to part of this. So notice your own reaction to that. Some of us love conflict. Some of us do not like conflict and turbulence. All right? So these are the four key areas we're going we're gonna to look at. Number one, what's your own personal history around this stuff? And then your emotions that are tagged to it. All this is saying, in essence, is we all bring baggage to this area, this topic area. Right? Some of it good, some of it bad, whatever it is. It's really helpful to know what baggage you're carrying around with you. That's all that's saying is, do you know what you're, what you're lugging around with you? Number two, and this is the dynamic about how do we end up where we are? The traditional ways we've been approaching diversity and inclusion just happen to have some unintended consequences that keep white men from being engaged or us knowing how to engage white men around this. So we're going to talk about that. Third, and this is where we spend most of our time, is, is this whole dynamic of when cultures come together, it's natural that each culture that's coming together is going to have blind spots about the other. And when, again, you're going to hear me say over and over again, it's not about pe people's level of intelligence. It's not about their integrity. It's not about their motivation to be nice. It's a dynamic that exists automatically as cultures come together. You can't see because you're coming from two different perspectives. And then the last one is another dynamic that I see in organizations all the time is that one of the other norms of white male dominant culture, and again, we'll get into the definitions I'm using as I throw out terms here, is that we want to move to a problem solving focus right away. Right? So for those of you in the room, typically, because this is again ge usually gender biased, and we'll talk about the, the differences there. How many men have conversations with their wives, whether the wife's sharing an issue or a problem they're having at work or at home or somewhere else? What do you want to do when she's talking to you, and what does she end up saying to you after you've said what you said? What's the, fix it. yeah, right? <laughs> well, I want to fix it and she wants me to listen to it, right? Yeah, what's the point of listening, right? So again, that's one of the cultural dynamics we just want to talk about, because again, if that's the dominant cultural norm, okay, we've got a problem here, let's fix it. It doesn't work in this arena very well. So we're set up for some fail potential failure there, right? But we're just going to jump right in. White men. What goes on for you when you see those words up there or hear me speak them? Just for, you know, kind of free association, whatever it is. White men. Power. Power. Control. 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 White men. Colonial. Colonial. Colonialism. White men. Privilege. Privilege. Authority. 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 White men. 
Legacy. Me. Me. <laughs> White men. Older, oh, so that's great to know. I notice that I associate older white men with that. Yeah, so older white men. Nowadays what? Excluded. Sorry. Nowadays excluded. Employable. Employable. White men. <laughs> Money makers. White men. Arrogant. Arrogant. <laughs> Can't jump. It's got to come up sooner or later. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> White men, a couple other ones. Decision makers. Decision makers, homeowners. Not anymore. Yeah, right. It's, it's, some things are changing, there's dynamics in there, and there's still some baggage that goes along with it. I want to invite all the white men to stand up in the room, if you would. What was it like for any of you hearing those terms being thrown around associated with potentially you? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? Felt like stereotyping, like wasn't you're not talking about me. What else? Fairly true. Some of it. Fairly true. Some of it's true. Anything else people felt? Any of you guys felt? Checking yourself. Sorry? Checking yourself. Checking yourself to see is that accurate for me? Is that not accurate for me? Anybody felt guilt or shame? Sometimes that comes up for some 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 people related to it. Here, not so much. Okay, great. All right. What does it feel like to just be singled out as white men in a room? Different, interesting. What else? Where are others? Majority. You feel like majority? Does it feel uncomfortable? Does it feel comfortable? A little, little uncomfortable. Spotlight, right? So thank you very much for, for putting yourself out there. Appreciate it. Right? So there's, all this is saying is there's a whole bunch of baggage just even around the two words. When we first started this work as a company, about 15, well, it was probably about 18 years ago, we would have to go through the legal, we usually work in corporations, we would have to go to the legal department of their organization first and say, are we allowed to use the terms white men and hire a company called white men as full diversity partners? I mean, the dynamic around these two words is incredible, I and mean, we've come a long way. I've been doing this diversity conference for probably four or five years. Four or five years ago, there were not many white men in the room. Right? So we are making progress in a way, and then we're going to talk more about, well, some people are stunned. No, we're not. <laughs> right? But again, just the dynamics of how things, how things are changing is just something to notice. So uh, we talked, what comes up when you see the, hear those words? Let's throw some other words up there. So what comes up for anybody in the room? If, if, the, if I say, you're privileged, right, for whatever it is. You're a man, you're privileged. You have male privilege. You're white, you have white privilege. You're able-bodied, you have able-bodied privilege. Right, you're heterosexual, you have heterosexual privilege. That's because you got a chip on you. <laughs> so that's what I want you to do is just notice, <laughs> notice your reaction of what goes on there, right? Or if someone says, that's racist, that's a racist comment you made. Right? You're a racist. You're a sexist. Notice that. Or the other side of it, there's a reverse discrimination. White men are on the bottom of the, the ladder now. Hell, if you want to get a promotion or a job, you need a, to be a person of color or a woman. I'm noticing visceral reactions for any of, the, right, any of these words that I'm putting up there, right? Because it goes on for all of us. We've got stuff that are attached to these things. Or diversity candidate. Did you get a diversity candidate on your slate? Like, what the hell is a diversity candidate? Right? It's all, what does that even mean for some people? Or, right? So there's just stuff that goes on for us. So all I want you to do now is think about, yeah, in my personal history, what stands out for me related to this whole concept of white men and diversity? So it might be any of the things I've talked about before. Here's a couple other things that might spark your interest. So, so for example, uh, my history related to white men is either I or another white guy I know got their hand slapped because they did something wrong related to, to diversity, so I'm not going to do anything, right? Because I don't want to get my hand slapped. That's my story. Right? Or story might be that I work with a bunch of white guys and they just don't get it or they don't want to get it. Right? So whatever, it, any, any, say they support it, but I don't see any actions to follow through. They put it in words, they put it in the mission statement, and then we're done. Right? Whatever your story is. So I want you just with the people at your table, two or three, not the full table necessarily, just, just for time, and share 
what story, what, you, what, no, what do you notice comes up for you related to this whole concept of white men and diversity? It might be personal, it might be related to somebody you know. And each time I have you break in small groups, I'm going to wander around so I can listen in so I can keep us on target for what's, what's going on in the room. All right, so just about four or five minutes, not a lot of time. But I want you to think about what emotions came up for you as you told the story or remembered your interactions around this stuff, or what emotions did you notice in the other people who were telling the stories, just to bring that side into it. So what are some examples, what are some of the things people shared about their experience with white men and diversity, and then also, or just individually, what were the emotions that went along with that? Frustration. frustration. You noticed a lot of frustration in the conversations. Defensiveness. Defensiveness. Anger. Anger. Confusion. Lower left, what you have up there. Lower, oh, what the hell is going on? <laughs> right? But the main point of this is just for it to sink into all of us is, oh yeah, I'm carrying some stories with me. And one of the first things I do with people is do a time check, which means, when did that happen? Well, that was back in 85. You know, because it was so huge. I saw somebody get fired for doing this. Right? It's like, okay, great. That was 85. Right? <laughs> Has anything changed? In the and that's just humans. We do that as humans. We hold on to what was a really important story to us, and it, it becomes a rock for us. And sometimes that helps us, but most of the time that hinders us. So that's just one thing I want you to do, is do a reality check of when, when did that occur. Right? But also just to notice, yeah, I'm bringing, I'm bringing something to the table when I'm getting into this conversation. And we all know most communication is nonverbal, right? So you, you got to remember, if I'm going to have this conversation about white men and diversity, it's really nice for me to know I'm bringing anger to this conversation. Because she's going to sense it whether I'm pretending I'm not angry. And I'm not angry, <laughs> right? When everything about me says, I'm pissed off. Right? So just notice what you're bringing to the table is what's really important related to this. So how do you think that affects your ability to partner with white men, or if you're a white man, to engage with this stuff in creating a more diverse and, uh, so, so name either the emotion that you had or that you saw at the table. So how would it affect it if you're really frust you're bringing frustration to this? Or you're bringing anger to this? Yeah. I've noticed for myself, I mean, not just in this particular kind of type of context, but in any time where I sense someone is really angry, but in a generalized sense, I shut down. Yeah. I stop talking. I don't, I, you know, oh, I've, I've said enough, and there's nothing I can say that will improve the subject. I'm, I just need to close my mouth. Yeah, because we, we, we're not taught well how to deal with emotions, because again, back to white male dominant culture in the U.S., where do, where do emotions belong? Outside of the workplace. Right? You leave those, so we don't have a lot of skill sets in doing that, so typically bringing these emotions in, what it does is shuts people down. Right? And what you need to have is conversations around this. Most white men that I talk to around this topic, their experience is, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Because when I've, 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 I've got the courage to say something around this, I've gotten killed for saying something. Because I said something ignorant or stupid or that pissed someone off or that brought the anger in them out. So I'm, there's no way I'm saying anything. So then I'm quiet, and then everybody starts saying, I don't support diversity and inclusion because I'm sitting back. So it's like, does anybody, any white men experience that? Like, I, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. So just for, again, data point for people in the room, a lot of white guys, that's their experience related to this. A lot of that's coming with this. So, so for each one of these, I just want you, this is just that check. So how aware are you of the history you bring and the emotions that are triggered for you? And then alternatively, how aware are you of the history or emotions that others bring? And can you be okay with that? Right? I coach a lot of white male executives and almost always one of the questions they ask me is, Tim, how do I get in conversations around this where the other person doesn't get emotional? <laughs> right? What's the answer to that? You can't give that one up. And it, you can just see, and I'll acknowledge for me, that was my question too, because it seems crazy. Because I was taught, be calm, right? If you're, if you're getting emotional, go away and come back when you're not emotional. Then we'll continue the conversation, right? You, you can just see, they kind of short circuit for a while. No, no, really, Tim, how? How would I do that, <laughs> right? What, what are the techniques that are eluding me to have the conversations without emotion? So just know that people are bringing that with them.
And then secondarily, this is just for you to assess for yourself, it might be your team, uh, if you're a manager or, or, or a larger part of the organization, how safe is it for people in your organization or your team to acknowledge that they're bringing anger or frustration or confusion around this topic? I think this is one of the damaging things about political correctness, because it shuts down conversation. Right? It makes sense that a white guy's pissed off about this stuff he doesn't get, and he's getting yelled at for that he doesn't think he's done anything wrong. But he can't say that, so back again, you're in that place of, I'm just going to sit here and be pissed off and then leave. I mean, typically, I mean, so again, this is the evolution. Used to be when white men came to diversity conferences, this, is, this was the stance in the back of the room. Okay, they made me come, I'm here. <laughs> right? Because they said nothing good can come of this, right? That's their experience. So again, how, how safe do we create this? And the reality, and this again goes against the norm of white male culture. You can't make progress, our, my experience and what the research shows, if you just try and stay at a head level, which is where most white men are really comfortable. You have to engage the heart. And that's very hard and it's a new experience. So just to notice that, where are you at with that? Okay, so how do we get here and what's, what's keeping us stuck here? A lot of it just has to do with a very rational and it makes sense traditional approach. If you had a predominantly white male organization, heterosexual, Christian, we can go down the list. I'm only going to look at these three, but please bring out any of these other ones you talk about, generations, socioeconomic class, etc. And then you start having these people of different races coming in, and they're starting to complain about their experience. Who are you going to focus on trying to understand if you're talking about race? Whose experience do you want to understand more fully? Sorry? I was thinking your own. Well, usually what we end up doing is saying, well, okay, let's understand those different people that are coming in because they're kind of complaining. We need to, what's the experience, what's your experience as a person of color in this organization? Right? Does that make sense? That you'd want to know, because it's, it's a foreign to you, you, you want to know more about that. If you're going to talk about gender, whose experience do we tend to want to focus on? Women. What's your experience here as a woman on this, on this construction crew that's all men? Right? It makes sense. If you're talking about sexual orientation, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, etc., and on down the list. It makes sense and it's absolutely necessary that we do this. But most organizations stop there. So if we stop there, what goes unexamined? What does it mean to be white? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be heterosexual? Right, in isolation and then in cumulative. What does it mean to be a heterosexual white man who's Christian and uh, you know, 50 years old and, right? We tend not to explore this arena at all and there's consequences for not exploring that, yeah. Why would you say that so with organizations? Why does that go? I think because this is a natural and necessary and demanded focus, right? When people of color first started coming into organizations, they demanded that they got some attention. You start having employee resource groups, right? So then you think, okay, that's what we're going to do. The reason this is unexamined is because it's invisible to us, right? It's where we're going to go. Well, so if you want to stop a conversation with a white person who's never done any work around this stuff, ask, what's it, what does it mean to you to be white? For me? I, you don't need to answer this rhetorical. <laughs> I, I'm, just say, I'm just saying, I don't want to put you on the spot, right? But you ask a white person who's never thought about that, th it just think, what? This is what you'll get, right? The, the nothing comes out because I've never, I don't think of, what they'll finally say is I've never thought of myself as white. I'm just a person, right? So it's, it's just invisible. We don't think about it because it's so normative. It's normal. It's the dominant culture. It's pervasive. We don't see it. It's the water we're swimming in, right? All those things. Right? And there's a consequence for this. Because if that's true, then if, as a white guy, then this diversity stuff is obviously not about me because we never talk about it. Because right? it's always about those other people and their problems and their issues. Right? So therefore, the best you're going to get out of me is apathy. Right? This is back of the room. Shit, if you, excuse my language. If I've got to go to one of these things again, right, I'll see. I'll see I'll sit in the back and we'll waste time and money and you guys can have your little employee resource groups and then we'll get back to work, All right? Okay, cool. That's the best you're gonna get out of me because I, I have nothing to do. The worst you're gonna get out of me is resistance because it doesn't have anything to do with me but they're getting time to go to these employee resource groups and they're getting this attention so that's not good so I'm gonna, I'm gonna resist this in some way 
And I know it's politically not correct to resist it overtly, so how am I going to resist it? Covertly, right? So that's typically what you're going to get. Right? Again, it makes sense. It doesn't make this person bad. It means the setup of the situation leads me to this. If there's nothing for me to learn about my own culture, because I don't nobody's even defined that I have one, right? I've got no responsibility to reflect on what does this mean to me, right? Why would I be involved in this, right? And I get to have lots of blind spots of the invisibility we just talked about because it's never the, the lights never shined on it. So I cruise through life thinking I'm a good guy, I'm I'm fair, and I treat everybody the same. What the hell are we spending all this time and money on diversity and inclusion for? If everybody just respected each other, we'd be done. Right? That's the experience that you have there. And this is one's the really damning in a way, is I have to learn from these other people. And the consequences of that are, I don't know anything, so I've got no responsibility to learn anything. So could you tell me one more time again why it's difficult being a woman here? Because the last 30 stories I heard from women <laughs> haven't quite sunk in yet. Right? I mean, does that feel familiar to people? Because I, I get to sit in the space of not knowing and, it's, and it being okay. Which then it adds this, and this is the typical setup for most organizations related to diversity and inclusion, is who's in charge of diversity and inclusion, who's on your diversity and inclusion councils. Let's go back a slide. Would it be this group? <laughs> well, that's great if it's not. That's progress if you got more of this group involved there. Right? That's fantastic. But typically what happens is this group has the added burden of being other and then educating the majority of people in the room who already discount their perspective. How likely for success is that model? Right? It's not going to happen. Right? So, just then, so then we kind of ask, again, rhetorically, we wonder why aren't white men more engaged in this? Right? So it's, again, we're not bad. It made sense why we're doing what we're doing. It's just that we have to do more. Okay? So these are the key questions that come out of this. What does it mean to be white and male? And again, heterosexual, able-bodied, Christian, all the other kind of majority things that go along with it. You ask this to most white men who have, who have done this work, and their first response is almost always, and I remember when this was mine, well, I never considered myself part of a white male group. Now, people who aren't white men hear that and, th and think, are you like crazy? Are you dense, right? Have you ever looked in a mirror, Tim? Right? Right? Because your experience is, you're, yeah, you, you, you belong with those kind of white guys. Mo what's most white guys' experience of, uh, how many of you guys think of yourselves as white men? So a few of you do, but most of us don't. We, th we are taught to think in individual terms. I'm an individual. Talk to me as Tim. Don't put me in some group. Right? So just to notice that. So that sets up a dynamic of me getting defensive and pissed off when you want to start talking about white men as a group and putting me in that group. Because I don't belong there, right? You already heard some, some of us say that. The other thing, though, that re relates to that is because I've never considered myself in part of a white male group is I've never had to think about is my life experience different as a result of being in the white male group? Back to the whole privilege thing. Right? So is it possible that I've been in this group I didn't know that I was in that was getting these benefits that I haven't seen because I never looked at the grouping of it? Because I worked hard, as in, back to the both end, oh, so what you're saying, Tim, at some level is as an individual, you worked really hard for what you got. But there was this groupness that you belonged to that you didn't even see or think about that might have had privileges and benefits that went along with it. Right? Oh, as a white guy, I can kind of get that. Well, that's possible. And that's all I want from, from when I first start working with white men. Is that, is that possible? Yeah, that might be possible. Right? So let's look a little deeper if that's possible. That's, that's the work here. But, and you can see how it's set up that we don't go there. The next question is, what does it mean to be a member of the predominant white male culture? When I keep talking about culture, that's what this has, has to do with. Most white men, as you start trying to describe the culture and what it is, will say, that's not white male culture. That's just normal business culture. That's just effective way of operating, right? Again, because I don't see it as a culture. But we could all describe, what, if you were going to tell somebody to be successful in a white man's world, given those terms, and again, notice your own visceral reaction to that, what would you say? How do you need to act? How do you need to talk? How do you need to dress? What are some things that just come to mind? How should I talk? If I want to be seen as credible and um, competent in a, in, a, in a typical organization, how should I talk? Confidence. With confidence. Have a northern accent, definitely not a southern accent or any kind of foreign accent. Be a native speaker. What else? Speak English clearly. 
Speak English clearly, yeah, back to that accent. Should I speak um, in long, rambling sentences and flowery language? No. Bullet, you know, if you could get it down to bullets, dude, <laughs> that would be really good, right? So we know there's all these things that are part of that culture, right? And we can go to any aspect of it. Should I know about sports? Yes. Uh, dang straight, right? Could you believe the call that ref made last night? I mean, I gotta be able to talk about that. To be able to connect and have credibility, right? Should I show emotion? Should I cry? There's no crying in only baseball. Yeah, only for the Ducks lot. <laughs> only if it's related to one of the other components. <laughs> right? So we can describe the dominant, what's the accepted normal culture. But when you describe it to most white men, they think, well, yeah, you should be concise and speak in bullets. And well, hell, you should know about sports. And right? That's not a ma white man culture. That's just the way it should be. <laughs> Right? And again, to someone who's not a white man, that just sounds crazy, but to a white guy, just like, well, it's worked so far. Right? <laughs> Our organization's been pretty successful, hasn't it? Why do you want, right, go right to that, why do you want to change things? Which leads us to the next reaction that most white men have when you start looking at this stuff is, why are you bashing it? Why are you making it bad? Why are you saying it's evil? And my question is always, wow, where did you hear that it was bad and evil in our describing what it looked like? And they're always like, well, I don't know, but you're implying that it's, <laughs> that it's bad and it's evil. So again, just to notice the, the emotional reactions that go, we just want to be able to describe the water and then what's the consequence of that if that's the water that we're swimming in, all right? And anytime I'm going through this, you have a comment or a question or a uh, disagreement, just let me know. So just related to this, I just want to point this out because um, I, I think it's one of the things that gets in our way. And it goes back to that earlier slide. What we tend to want to do again is learn about the other that's different. And what research has shown is that that's the worst way to go about learning about culture and difference. That you have to start with your own culture. What is my, so it goes back to why we're so tripped up with this. Because if I never think I have a culture, anytime someone presents something different, the de facto is I'm going to project my cultural norms as a judgment on theirs. Right? So if someone comes to me and says, Tim, I don't speak in that linear, bulleted fashion where A follows B to C. I speak in a circular fashion right? that's full of story. And, I'll, and if I don't know that I have a culture, I'll just think, well, that's wrong. Right? That would be very inefficient. Right? Let me mentor you. <laughs> right? Have you ever have, you have set up any mentoring programs? Right? That's, what you see. that's what you tend to do if you haven't looked at your own culture first, is you think you need to educate people who are different to the correct way of being. But you don't think of it in those terms. You're just thinking, this is the way it's been. Right? So you have to start, once you, once you have a framework for, oh, I was taught how to speak in bullets. It's not the only way to speak. It's very different to then engage with someone who speaks differently and see value in that, as opposed to, um, a, a deficit in that. Right, so just want to point that out. We typically want to start the other way and it's counterintuitive. You have to start by learning your own culture. Right? So again, just your chance to assess. Personally, how much do you see white men and their diversity that they bring, because there's a lot of diversity in, in, amongst white men, is critical to our success. And how much do you understand from both perspectives, whether you're a white man or not, what it means to be a white man? What are you going to be blind to? What you're not going to be blind to? What your experience is? Because that gets in our way. And then number two, organizationally, how well do we do that, right? Are our diversity, and so some of you are doing great. Our diversity inclusion efforts have white men engaged. They're in the brochures. They're, they talk about the value to them. For others, it's not there. So just to notice that, where, where are we doing? And then secondarily, is, as you can see, do we create safe places for people in the dominant culture to be able to say, I don't get what you're talking about. I don't see all this oppression. I don't see this discrimination, right? Because that's the reality for them. Can you, so is that allowed? Right? And again, just notice your own reactions to that. It requires progress on both the dominant and the marginal cultures, and we'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute. But like I said, this is the crux. This is the thing that, for, for me and most people that I work with, takes away blame from anybody. It just says there is a natural consequence to the dynamics of cultures coming together. It's an automatic thing that happens, right? Couple of bullets before we go further. Everybody is at a different place in their ability to even notice cultural difference or understand their own culture, right? It requires 
attention and life experience. If you lived in a very um, homogenized culture, i.e. a very similar culture, most people around you were similar, it's very hard to have much depth in understanding other cultures. You just haven't had much life experience. It hasn't been taught to you. Right? So we're all at different places and we can all develop fur further. Again, the main point for me, nobody's bad because they're going to have the blind spots that come from this dynamic. It doesn't make you bad, doesn't make you stupid, doesn't make you evil. It's natural that you would have these blind spots. Okay? And the third one, just for everybody in this room to keep in mind, we all, there's an instrument that we use called the Intercultural Development Inventory, IDI. I've been using it for years. It's a great instrument because what it does is it assesses where you think your competence level is related to culture and then where your actual level is related to culture. And everyone I've ever tested, myself included, heavily overestimates their capability. <laughs> right? So everybody in this room, for wherever you think you are, you are not. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just take, what a lot of people talk about related to cultural competence and they're starting to shift the two, it's about cultural humility. It's about starting from a place of going, I know I've got blind spots. You have to, right? We're going to talk about that. But the, it's just that whole thing, you, you overestimate. So just be open to the fact that you don't know what you don't know is out there. Yeah, Carol. Do you think there's any correlation between organizational culture and your own, in looking at your own culture in terms of being a white woman or a white man? Yes. Privilege? Yeah, typically. Difficulties similar? Yeah, typically if I grow up in a community and then move into an organization that has very similar cultures, I'll be very blind to culture. I will just think. This is the way humans are. So that's most white men's experience because most, and again, you can argue with me of this, just, this is just our premise. Most of the institutions in the US, most of the dynamics in the US, it's heavily um, white male culturally dominated, not necessarily dominated by white men, right? So I grow up in that culture, I go to an organization in that culture, I don't notice it. Now this is, so this is the dynamic, this will be a great explanation. White women, typically go into an organization and they're very clear about the sexist dynamics that go on, if there are any. Because they can see how women are treated differently than men. So they're very aware of the male cultural component. What, they're, what are they blind to? All the people of color, especially the, the women of color in the room, white. Most women are blind to the fact that they have white privilege or they have a white culture. Right? So it, it, it's just you go through, so heterosexual, right, able-bodied, whatever it happens to be. That makes sense? Yeah. yeah. Right, and that's one of the dynamics I see all the time with women is most white women experience them, themselves as being sisters with their women of color um, colleagues, and the women of color experience the white women as being there on issues related to sexism and totally out the door on issues related to race and ethnicity. And the white women don't see themselves that way and it causes a lot of friction. And again, it makes sense. It's not that white women are stupid, bad. That's their blind spot, is their whiteness related to that. Just like for most people in the room who are, are I'm making an assumption are heterosexual, that's our blindness. We don't think in terms of heterosexual privilege because I don't think about it. <laughs> right? I'm heterosexual. I've always been heterosexual. Most people I know are heterosexual. Right? Except the, for that one or two different people out there. Right? But it, it's just this, this assumption that we go with. All right? So, again, we talked about culture just real quick to be sure we're all on the same page. All I'm saying is culture is, so white male culture, all, when I say that, all I'm saying is there are patterns of behaviors and belief that are shared by most members of the group, right? No sports, speaking bullet, that kind of stuff, right? It's passed down generationally through imitation, uh, so it's done informally in your families. They're, they teach you on the playground you're taught. I learned, I learned a whole lot about what it means to be a boy, particularly on the playground, Not, don't cry. You know, be good athletic, right? All those things. And we're taught it in our school systems, too. We're taught it formally. We're taught it through the media. It's basically, we're taught in lots of different ways. And the big thing is it describes the, accu very accurately describes the characteristics of a group, but not any individual, right? So that's where any, any white man in this room could easily say, that does not describe me, right? And that, and that could be accurate. And at the same time, there's probably a whole bunch of the group characteristics that actually do describe you, and you might not just be aware of it. But the key there is, again, it's about, it's just like um, statistics. You know, you can very accurately predict a population, but you can't predict any individual in that population. The main thing is this bottom bullet and then the thing in white. What culture does is it shapes how we see things in the world and how we interpret them. It creates a lens we see through. And we don't know we have the lens, basically. 
But so what culture, the shorthand, what culture does is it puts a pair of cultural glasses on you and doesn't tell you that it put those on. That's what culture does, <laughs> okay? So it's whatever tint, whatever hue, whatever distortions it has, you just think are normal. Okay, so I'm gonna use a couple of terms. I don't wanna spend a whole bunch of time here. But um, some people just get lost when I start talking in terms of cultural norms or cultural, um, uh, like the aspects of white male culture. That aren't you just stereotyping people? Right, so I just wanna make a quick distinction between the two. Stereotypes are non-scientific overgeneralizations based on very limited experience and applied to everybody in a group. Those people are this way, right? Cultural norms are researched by ethnographers over a bunch of time that basically says, how are these people acting and how are, how are they interacting? And the inside, they talk to the insiders and the insiders say, that's accurate for us. Stereotypes is an outsider saying, that's how those people are. Right, so that's one of the distinctions. Typically, it's applied to all members of the group. There again, it's a description of, of, of many. This is a big difference. When people stereotype, they're typically thinking in terms of innate characteristics. That's just the way those people are. Ethnographers and cu cultural normists say that's how they've been educated to act. All right, so I just want to make that distinction. This one shuts down curiosity. This one increases it. So for an example, um, women are too emotional. Stereotype or cultural norm? Stereotype. stereotype. There's typically there's a judgment in a stereotype, right? What would be a cultural norm related to women and emotion? Women generally the, show more yeah, women are generally taught to be or allowed to show more emotion than men are in our society, right? Most people in the room would be able to go, that sounds pretty accurate, right? Or more women are in touch with their feelings than men are. What that allows is any woman in the room to go, yeah, that's usually most women are, but I'm not. Right? Versus the stereotype saying all women are this way. So that's the distinction. This one's based on data. It rings true to everybody in the group, even though they can distinguish themselves individually from it. All right? So just notice your reaction to those. So this is the core concept you, we, that we can never forget. And I get to see this, this gets us in trouble in so many different arenas. That there's always a dominant culture that's operating that, again, is everywhere. And you can't see it. This is the one that's invisible but it creates the de facto standards for be of behavior. It's what determines who's qualified and who's not, who's professional and who's not, who's high potential and who's not. It's all these things that go on for us where we make judgments about stuff, usually unspoken, almost always invisible, and then there's these other cultures that are subordinate to it or marginal to it that have to assimilate in order to be successful. What does assimilate to be successful mean? Yeah, I need to, to assimilate means I need to take on the characteristics of this normative culture in order to be deemed as qualified, in order to be deemed as high potential, in order to be deemed as competent. I need to change my behaviors to fit in to this. So that's a dynamic that goes on. And if we're not aware of this, it gets in our way in so many different ways, okay? So just to notice that. Again, this is just a quick one off because remember we talked about people bring baggage. People bring baggage to everything, including terminology. So I know a lot of people get frustrated if I use the term dominant. I'm not dominant. I'm not dominating anybody. Okay, fine. <laughs> Choose any other word that might work for you, right? Predominant, prevalent, pervasive, mainstream, normal. That's the ins versus the out, right? Choose your own word. I tend to try and go to pervasive because that's very descriptive. It's pervasive. It's the water again that we're swimming in. It's just everywhere. It's the air we're breathing. Same thing some people say, don't put me in a subordinate culture. I'm not subordinate to anybody. Okay, right? Choose whatever word works for you. You're more isolated. You're kind of on the outs. I use marginal because, again, that's more descriptive. There's, a, there's the bulk of the primary culture and then there's these other cultures that are, you know, you're kind of marginalized. You have to work your way in. Okay? So just choose whatever terminology works for you. Right? So I want you to just think in terms of, given what you, just what we've just covered so far on this, what are some areas of my life where I'm in the dominant culture? What are some areas of my life where I'm not in the dominant culture? Because right? all of us will probably have some experiences across the board. Right? So for example, one of the people in the last session I was did was a gentleman who's like, um, you know, my field crew, mostly men, I'm in the dominant culture. I go home, I've got a wife and four daughters, yes. no longer. <laughs> Dominant culture, <laughs> right? Or a person of color in Oregon, because I typically hear this, you know, at work, I'm, I'm in the non-dominant culture. When I go back to my community or my church, I'm in the dominant culture there, right? So whatever, wherever it is for you, think in terms of a couple, you know, work, 
community home, wherever, just in your tables, talk about where, where, where aspects where you find yourself in a dominant cultural setting, where aspects where you find yourself in a non-dominant cultural setting, right? So again, just about three, four, well, four or five minutes, I'll come around, listen in, and we'll go from there. You don't, th you don't think about the arenas that you're dominant or able-bodied, yeah. So uh, families with kids or people with kids, so I don't have one, I don't have kids. Yeah. And somebody calls into work, they're like, oh, my kid's sick. And everybody's like, oh, no problem, no worries. And yeah. then I call in and say, hey, my dog's throwing up. They're like, what should we do here? <laughs> yeah. No, that's huge. That's huge in organizations that I consult in, particularly with younger people coming into the workforce. And that's where a lot of organizations are starting to go, oh, my God, there's one organization I work for where the CEO said, everybody's allowed to have a kid, right? Which means if your kid's your dog, that's okay. If your kid is yoga class, that's okay, right? Because there's this huge dynamic of, it's, o right? it's back to the norm, because that's the norm in the U.S. is having kids, so it's accept. I've got to go pick up my child at, at, after school. So we'll, we'll change all the schedules so that works. And you say, I've got to change my schedule so I can get to yoga. It's like, I don't think so, right? <laughs> So yes, yeah, th that's the invisibility of it. Because it, it just seems crazy at first when someone who out of the norm asks for something that's similar to what everybody in the norm has. Because it feels like what? Special privileges. Why should we give you dog privileges? We've never given anybody dog privileges before. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. But I want you to just notice that. Yeah. That would be an interesting thing if, if you have kids and a dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? The other thing that I want to want, to want again, just to notice the invisibility of, again, if you're a Christian, how many of you talked about that? So just to notice this other stuff that's there, we don't notice. The other one I don't want us to forget is this. We talked about this just at one table, so I want to make sure we talk about it as a large group. I, as a heterosexual white man who was raised Christian and is able-bodied, just go down the list, I'm in the dominant culture in just about everything. Right? I've got a whole bunch of experiences individually where I went to somebody's neighborhood and I wasn't in the dominant culture. I used to work in a place that was women dominated. Right? It was all women there, it was just me. So I get what your life experience is like when somebody else is talking about uh, not being in the dominant culture. What's the difference between my experience of non-dominance and somebody else's experience of non-dominance who doesn't have all those characteristics that I have? I'm visiting. It's situational to me, right? And I usually have a whole bunch of choice about do I want to work in a place that's dominated by women or not? I, you know, I got a choice around that. Somebody who's not in those, so an African American woman who was at the table we were talking about in Oregon, you know, was basically saying, well, other than my church and my house, right? Everywhere I go, I'm in the non dominant culture. That's a different experience, because it's systemic, it's everywhere, it's 24-7. So where I see a lot of us get in trouble, and this is the whole thing about the difference between intention and impact, I see a whole lot of people in, in whatever aspect of the dominant culture trying to reach out and say, I get what you're going through. Right? And uh, the intent is one, because I want to connect with you and I want to I try and figure this out. What's the person's experience when I'm coming from a situational experience of non dominance to someone who's coming from a systemic experience of non dominance? How do they hear that? Patronizing. Patronizing. Right? And then so back again to so why don't we get, make progress on that? Right? Because I go, I reached out, she snubbed me, I'm done, right? I'm not going to, it took a lot of courage to try and reach out. So just to notice again how that kind of stuff gets in our way, right? But we don't, so we don't want to lose sight of that. So now we're just going to look at, so what does this mean? That basically some of us are fish in water. And again, notice, we all notice where we're not in the water. Back again, I just want you to know that, right? We're all very clear where we're not in the dominant culture, and we are all totally blind to where we are in the dominant culture. That's the nature of this. It's difficult to see and understand one's culture until one moves outside of it. So how many of you have moved around the country, kind of regionally, or taken trips outside of the country? That's when you find out what your culture is. Right? So what are some of the things when you've traveled around that you found out, oh, people don't do that things that way here? What are some specific examples, just so we can kind of name some? Speak English, right? Have signs in English. Like, Toilet seat cover. Toilets, <laughs> for God's sake. Yeah. Right? Like, wh where's the toilet? What, that's right there. It's that hole in the ground. What's your problem? <laughs> right? What else? Coffee. Northwest coffee. Coffee. Or the strength of coffee or the size of coffee. 
right? So, I mean, it just goes on and on and on, but you don't notice that difference jarring until it's, it's around you. The one I love the most, because I think it's just one of the most ingrained and it's really invisible, is what's called proximity or personal space. Every culture has a normal distance to stand. And if you do something that's outside of the norm, <laughs> right? What goes on? It's like, oh, right? But no one ever taught anybody in the US you need to be about 24. Did anybody learn this in grade school? Be 24 inches away from somebody else. No, nobody taught you that. You just knew it because people get all freaked out if you're too close or ignore you if you're too far. So, you, you know, you just learned as a kid, okay, this is it, <laughs> right? They do over, I don't know if you've ever seen overhead videos of people from different cultures with different, different proximities, and literally they go around the room because one person is backing away <laughs> and the other one is like walking towards them. <laughs> but when they ask them what was going on, they have no clue because it's not conscious. All they'll say it was it was uncomfortable. This person didn't want to talk to me or that it was just uncomfortable. This person was coming on to me, right? <laughs> Right, that's what, because you, you just have, you remember you've got your lens of what's normal and what's not. So again, we have a cultural lens we just don't know we have. So we just want to look at, so what's the consequence of that? So we're just, we're just going to look generically again, because we only have 90 minutes, we're not getting into a whole bunch of detail. But what if, the, and this is me, let's, let's just say, I'm white, I'm heterosexual, I'm male, I'm able-bodied, I'm Christian, all these things. No one's ever talked to me about culture. I've heard about these other cultures, right, that setup that we talked about. Don't know that I'm swimming in water. I just think this is the way life is. This is the way humans act, okay? Where most people in the dominant culture are. How might I, just generically, just, just think about this generally, how might I view or treat someone who be say, behaves outside the norms of what I think humans should be doing? What would anybody in this circumstance do? What are, what, what are some of the things you would do? Try to correct them, Try to correct them benevolently. N out of niceness, out of mentoring, <laughs> right? What else might I do? I'm going to pass some level of judgment. And the reality is, as humans, I haven't met anybody who sees, so unless they've done some work around this, who sees somebody doing something different and goes, oh, that's a much better way, right? We all go, oh, no, 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 let me show you how to do that, right? So the judgment is almost always, you're not quite up to my level. You're not up to par, you're not qualified enough, you're not speaking well enough, you don't, your bullets aren't sharp enough, right? It's all these things. What else? So we have judgment, suspicion. some level of suspicion or just confusion or discomfort, right? This person's standing too close to me. It's like, right? It's like, I, I just don't like working with them, right? That might, you see how those things might just naturally happen. And again, it doesn't make me bad, doesn't make me evil. I'm just not noticing that I'm making these judgments because they feel like natural judgments. Yeah. Organizationally, they might think somebody's a risk or it cause a liability. They might let's say they're too honest. Organizationally, they might cause a risk or a liability, or they might not be a good cultural fit for us, right? Because they're going to cause too many problems, right? Yeah. That's great if you do, but, I, but my experience with research shows is as humans, because we're tribal, we tend to want things that are similar. It's, it's a natural, instinctive thing for most of us. For some of us, it's not. Part of this, well, I love Milton Bennett, if any of you know kind of Milton Bennett, who does a lot of work in this realm. He, he basically said, this is the first time it kind of dawned on me what he was saying is, the re one of the reasons intercultural competence is so difficult is because we're training ourselves against our wiring in a way. We're wired to be tribal, right? Because you think about it, right? If I'm trying to survive and I've got people who look like me and act like me and we're helping each other and then somebody who's different is coming along, my first thought is not, let's invite them in and see if they're helpful, right? Our first thought is to survive is different, probably not helpful, right? It's, it's, so. So yeah, some of us have learned that, some of us are, are already ingrained with that, that's great, but that's the goal, is how do I shift from this unconscious reaction of just what we talked about, right? They're unqualified, they're too emotional, they're not emotional enough, they're weaker, typically judged as less than, to this new thing, and that's what diversity and inclusion is about, is, oh wow, that's different. What are the pros to that? What are the cons to it? How are we doing it? Why are we doing it the way we're doing it? That, those are the questions that need to come up.
Do we allow space for people to make mistakes or say something offensive? So a couple quick concrete examples, because a lot of people get it conceptually but want something concrete. So for example, one of the cultural differences is called individualistic and collectivist, I or we cultures. People are vaguely familiar with that. So the US is a very I, individualistic oriented culture. So I was taught to th think in terms of me, Tim, and what I've accomplished. So when I get an interview question or my manager's talking to me and says, Tim, what have you accomplished? I very naturally and easy can run off a list of the stuff that I've done. Uh, you know, I help reduce costs in our, in our environment by this, and I improve things over here by doing this, right? It's just natural, con normal conversation. Somebody who's raised in a collectivist conversation, how might they respond to that type of question? What have you accomplished? Well, the group that I was on, we did these incredible things. And this other team that I was on, we did these incredible things. If I don't have a lens for that cultural difference, and I'm looking, and I'm a man, hiring manager or promoting manager looking for a go-getter who's self-starting and, and I know is going to be able to work on their own, who's more qualified? The person who spoke in my language, in the I language. Right? Where the other person might have, and this is typically what goes on in organizations, the other person typically knows they got way more qualifications and abilities than this person, but they didn't speak in a language that I understood or interpreted right. So I walked, and this is what's really key, I walk away saying I hired the most qualified person. Right? Because that's my blind spot. I didn't know that there was a cultural dynamic. Yeah? So maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. That's all right. So for, so, yeah, so for a concrete example of that is it's really hard because it's, it, it's my blind spot. It's very hard to educate me for all the cultural differences in the world that I might need to listen for in an interview, right? Because it's blind spots. So if that's true, what's one of the best ways to start eliminating bias in our interviewing process? And I know some of your agencies are doing this. What's one of the best ways to do that? mixed, having a diverse hiring panel and selection process throughout, throughout each stage. Because if you have a diverse panel, somebody else is going to be able to say, oh no, their languaging is that they will never say I, right? Does that make sense? But I wouldn't necessarily notice that. And then the more I educate myself, the more I start noticing those things as well. But there's, it's just a progression, right? Does that, does that make sense? No. So I want to tie this in a little bit closer to what the real issue is. Okay. Um, we're still in a recession, okay, and if, uh, because of where I work, I know we're in a recession. Mm -hmm. And we're at the point that we're pitted against each other. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions about what, what white men think, but I think white men think that we took their jobs. We didn't take white men's jobs. And um, they sent those jobs overseas, mm -hmm. the guys at the top and the guys on the East Coast, so they could make more money, okay? So I'm, let's go. I'm with you. The, 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 the census does surveys year round. People don't realize that. It's not just every 10 years. And if you knew what was going on the last couple of months, they're slowly releasing the information that more white women work now in this country than white men. So we have to be clear what this is all about. It's about economics. Mm -hmm. Who's going to work in this damn country? Mm -hmm. How much money you're going to make? And are you going to move up the ladder? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So I want this tied in. Otherwise, it just floats out there. And I think most of us don't realize what is this diversity about, and what's the importance of culture and all this other stuff? So let me see if I can uh, try one explanation for it. And this is what's frustrating. Because if I don't do this first, I just get pissed off listening to you. I just shut you out and go, that angry black woman. Um, no, I, but that's, that's my experience of you if I haven't done this work. So this is where we all have work to do, remember? And it's, I'm not saying it's easy work. A lot of the work for people that already know this stuff is they got to sit patiently while other people who don't know this stuff learn some of it so we can start having the deeper conversations. And that's what's tough about a big group, right? Because you got half the room going, OK, I know this. And the other half of the room going, holy crap, I've never even thought of that. Right? So it's a, it's a tough dynamic. So I know it doesn't answer your question or help you. It's just the reality of what we're dealing with. If we want to be able to get to those conversations, we got to work with a big percentage of this room that's able to hear that differently. So I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Well, going along with her, the thing is, I, I agree with her. I don't feel like anyone's taken our jobs. But she said white men. She feels white men feel that way. But as a white man, I don't feel that way at all. Mm -hmm. so, 
Well, so this is a great example of how you can improve conversations, and this goes back to that both and, is when you're having a conversation around this stuff, is to check in with the person who's speaking and saying, are you talking about me as an individual white man, or are you talking about your experience with white men as a group, right? Because it goes back to the both and. Her experience of white man as a group is that, and what you're saying is that's not your individual experience, and you can still have the conversation without having to correct each other, right? Yeah? Absolutely. Be younger. Yeah. 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 Yes, and what I would say is there's a big assumption that younger white men don't have these issues. No, yeah, okay. Yeah, I just want to be clear that they still have the same a lot of the same blind spots because of the dominance of the culture. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. So. Uh, Yes, I, I do too. I mean, the, you, what you're talking about is deeper, larger systemic issues. And well, how can we do that? Well, that's a different conference. It's a, it's a different conference. Talk to your conference organizer. <laughs> right. I mean, it really is at some level. Is, or to, to say that we want that focus in the next conference that we have or, or with the people that we're working with. Talk right? I'm, I'm sorry? <laughs> what you do is you call your congressperson. Well, that too. Right? So, I. We're running low on time, so I want to be sure that we cover both ends of the spectrum. So this is the work that most people in the dominant culture have to do, is understanding their blind spots and that they're going to make erroneous and inaccurate judgments because of their blind spots. Let me just give one more concrete example, because it gets, again, a lot of people in the year. Typically, and research still shows, women get paid less than men in, or in organizations. What, what a lot of the research has shown is one of the reasons for that goes back to how women in the U.S. are, are um, enculturated or taught to talk about themselves and how men are, right? So it, and the way it shows up is if there's a stretch assignment, which means it's stretch, means you can't, you've never done it before, you don't know whether you can do it or not. It's beyond your current capabilities, so it's a stretch assignment, right? If you go to someone who's been educated in the white male cultural realm, realm or culture and say, can you handle this, what's the appropriate answer? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Absolutely, when do you need that done? Right? And then I might turn away and go, holy crap, I have <laughs> no idea how to do it, but I've been taught the correct way to respond. If I haven't been enculturated to that, how might I respond? So this is women, some, some Hispanic cultures, some Asian cultures, how might I respond? I don't know. I don't know. I've never done anything like that before. I would probably need assistance. If I don't have a cultural lens, who was ready for the stretch assignment? The person who was educated in white male culture. It might be a woman, it might be something else. So we, you know, we kind of keep learning that language, right? I walk away and people say, and I say, I gave it to the person who was ready. So they get promoted. The other thing is, if, when I come in, in our, more in the private sector than the public sector, and negotiate for my original salary, White men are taught to negotiate for high, because that's part of the culture, is coming confident, I can do that, that's not enough, you, you should pay me more than that. Whereas women are taught to enculturated to come in and say, oh wow, I can hear budgets are tight, I could probably get by with that, and, right? and so you start low and you keep getting lower and then you don't get the stretch assignments to grow. So there's just the dynamic that goes, and again, those people aren't evil. I wasn't intentionally trying to hold someone back. I just thought this person was ready, yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with somebody who's an internal processor and an internal thinker. Yeah. But um, in, in a culture where we start drifting to group interviews, we tend to migrate to the dominant culture, which is who knows how to handle the group, yeah. who knows how to defer the group at yeah. the appropriate time. Yeah. But the people who sit back and think and process and wait for their turn are perceived to be weak yep. or not ready for the job. Right. Or don't Absolutely. Stand up Absolutely. They can be left out of our yeah. interview process because we don't understand the introvert culture. Exactly. So that's how you can see diverse, this, the work around diversity and inclusion permeates all aspects of difference. It's the same, it's the same process. So we say, wow, what, what are our biases around introversion and extroversion? And this is what's really key. Are they serving us well? Right, this go back to, to bashing male culture. I'm not up here saying do away with white male culture and replace it with something else. I'm here saying analyze what your culture is and what blind spots it causes and whether it's serving you well or not, and then choose something that serves you better. All right? So I want to just switch gears here again before, before we close to get to at least to the other side. So same thing. 
here's this ignorant, and again, not, not using that pejoratively, ignorant Tim doesn't know he's part of a white male culture, doesn't see the water he's swimming in. How might I be viewed or treated by someone who does see the cultural differences because they've had to move in and out of the cultural differences all the time or every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? How do they see me when I go around saying, there's no issues here. If we just treat each other with respect, I don't see color, I don't see gender. How do they view me? What would you imagine? Just put yourself in that position. What would you think of me? Not very not self, that's very generous of you. Yes. Not self-aware, yes. right? But the non-generous thing is you are either one idiot, right? To not see what is so friggin' obvious to me Right? That's one option. And then that option quickly goes away because, you, Tim, and I know you're not stupid. So it's not that you're an idiot. What is it? There's only one other choice. You are willfully denying this and holding me back and protecting the other white guys. And all, right? It just goes on and on. It's a natural conclusion to reach. Right? And so I'm sitting there. This is where you see a lot of white guys are like, are you at the meeting where the white guys are hoarding the power? Because I have not been invited to that meeting yet. <laughs> right? Have, any guys, have, have you been invited to that meeting? Right? Because it's not their experience. I'm just sitting here thinking that things are hunky-dory. And, and again, I elevate. I, I think I'm better than I am as far as my intercultural competence. And so you're not going to, especially if you work for me, how likely are you then to have that conversation with me, right? We'll just put that up there so it's there. Only two choices, either stupid or willfully ignorant. How likely are you to come to me as your boss and say, Tim, can I tell you something? You don't know what you're doing related to diversity and inclusion. You are actually clueless. <laughs> right? Is that going to happen? No. Which then reinforces my ignorance. Because I go to my room and I say, Is there, are, do we have any diversity and inclusion issues here? I didn't think so. <laughs> so that data from our organization, and I see this in every organization I consult in. Every manager goes, that's not in our area, that's in some other area, right? But you can see how it gets set up that way. So again, this is the work for people that aren't in the dominant culture, is to believe me when I say, I don't see that. And I know it feels impossible, but it's just a different place to start. I think the fear that goes along with that for people in the non-dominant culture is if I give you that grace, Tim, you won't do anything. Right? And the reality is you need to give me that grace so I can do something. So, that you can, so the conversation needs to be, Tim, I'm starting to get that you may be not seeing this stuff that's going on, but I need you to see it. I need you to do the work to start seeing this stuff. So let me give you one other concrete example again so it's helpful. So one of the things I kept hearing when I first started doing this work related to gender differences was women would say, I say something in a meeting, no one hears it. Five minutes later, a white guy says it, and it's suddenly the most brilliant thing on the face of the earth. And I do this, I mean, I do this across the country. Every woman in the room shakes their head <laughs> violently, and every man in the room kind of goes, what? <laughs> right? So this is how this plays out, right? So my first experience is, there's, that does not happen. You're too sensitive. What? Well, let's talk about that, right? Let's talk about it, right? It's all kinds of stuff. But my, I just want you to, to hear the, the, pro, the process is that does not happen. You're too sensitive. Just speak louder. You'll be fine, <laughs> right? All the stuff that discounts their, her experience of this is actually happening. So then if, if we stay in partnership long enough and I'm, and, and I'm committed, she says to me, Tim, I need you to do some work around this, not go collect stories from other women that you're not going to believe. Start watching for it. I'm like, okay, fine. I go, damn, if that doesn't happen, right, in meetings, because now I'm watching it. But now this is the dynamic that goes on. Back to what we all have work to do. Her experience is she's not heard because she's a woman. When I watch the dynamic, what, what actually goes on is she's speaking in a way that women have been enculturated to speak, which is typically non-declarative, a more invitational, more offering. So she will say, well, I wonder if we would consider the possibility of, of maybe doing X, Y, and Z, because I think that might help us here. And again, back to it's not selective hearing. You're not speaking in a language that I'm listening for. You're not speaking white male ease. 
Right? Not that that's the right thing to do, but it's the language I'm used to listening for. Now this guy says, well, we need to do X, Y, and Z for these reasons. And I go, yes, that's exactly what we need to do. Right? But this is what's so important about being able to have the conversations, because her experience is walking away saying, women aren't respected here. And that's not my experience as a man. All the men get together and go, I don't, I don't treat you any differently because you're a woman. I don't see you any differently because you're a woman. What are you complaining about? Because we don't have the language about the cultural difference of, oh, the way you speak as a woman, I'm not hearing. It's a very different conversation. I don't feel attacked by that or misjudged or mischaracterized. Right? Does that make sense? Well, now this is right. So this is the other dynamic. This is the other dynamic that goes on. Right, which is, remember I talked about this is complex. Right, so each time, each time we illuminate something, we illuminate the next layer. So the next layer is the catch-22 of people in the non-dominant culture is. The catch-22 is, you're never gonna be a white man, because you're not a white man. So you're not gonna quite have all the nuances that I've learned for the 50 years of my life of how to act, what tone, when to speak, when not to speak, all these little things that say, Tim's acceptable here, right? So you're never, no matter how hard you try, so you're never, going to be, you're never going to be fully accepted. And then you change your behavior to try and be accepted, and what happens to you? You're rejected, you're rejected for changing your behavior, not only by the dominant culture, but by your own culture, because all the women say, she sold out. She's selling us out. She's acting like a damn man. <laughs> and she's getting ahead in the organization, right? So, but, so yeah, what we need is to be able to have these conversations without me. You know, if we first started and you said something like that, the reaction might have been, Oh, God, there's something else to complain about. Or, geez, come on, you're being so sad. Versus being able to go, wow, there is that dynamic, isn't there? She is going to get labeled the B word as a result of trying to fit into the culture. Or, and again, this is what's so important about this stuff is about what's the benefit for all of us. There's a whole bunch of white men who have been inculturated to act like white men who that's not who they are or how they operate best. Right? There's a whole bunch of introverted white men who go home from the day exhausted because they've been extroverting in order to be seen as valuable. Or they've been bulleting when it's not how they think. Right? So this is the whole thing for me about what's the benefit of this work is once we can start talking about these cultural differences and letting this other stuff go, we can start talking about how are you bringing your best self here? What would the workplace need to look like? What would it need to look like for you? Can we create that workplace that gets us a little closer to that? So that's, that's what this is all about for me. So we are out. I'm sorry, but my, my question, my long standing question yeah. is what is that culture going to be and who is going to make that decision? Yeah, and the answer is it depends on every organization. That's right, it's back to every organization has to sit down and say, what's the culture we need to be successful for the clients we have or the customers we serve or the products we produce and the people we have in our organization right back again to the either or people want to know well what's the best practice what's the best culture to have right it totally depends and but you're getting to other back to systemic stuff is who's making the decision right, right? if you have a cultural lens your decisions are going to be better because you're going to be listening for all the different cultural voices in your in your group or your organization if you don't, if you have the white male cultural lens only, you're going to be like, I'm at the head. I've heard a few people. This is what we're doing. Right? But it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. It's, it's slow, and that doesn't mean you don't keep pushing. Right? Last couple of questions. Well, it's 5 o'clock, and I know people are just totally exhausted. So I'm going to close. I hope you guys got some value out of it. If you want to stay and ask additional questions, I will hang out for as long as you want me to. So thanks. <laughs>